Well, I'm excited because I have been gone uh, a couple weeks, uh, whether it was a family emergency or last week I had the privilege of being at Transformation Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yes, so excited. I love Pastor Mike Todd and the amazing staff and team at, at Transformation. But I have to say, I was a little heartbroken because I wanted to be here. You know when you're so happy to be somewhere, but then you miss where you're not? That's where I was, a little, a little bit heartbroken, a little bit heartbroken. And that's a good thing. I missed you too. And, and it was a good thing though, because I think it made me have just a different spin and understanding on what is heartbreak. Have you ever been heartbroken? Well, okay, okay, okay. Maybe you're like the 16 year old and you're going flashing back to high school when that girl that you swore to your mom that you were gonna marry, like was gonna be your wife and then she broke your heart after Sadie Hawkins and you were heartbroken. Or, or maybe it's more serious. You dated the same person all four years in college. They were a college sweetheart and they broke up with you right before you graduated. Or maybe it's a little bit more serious. Maybe you have been married for a decade and whether by choice or circumstance, you find yourself on the other side of a divorce. But when we think about heartbreak, we automatically go to like romance and relationships. But do you know that heartbreak is so much more? Heartbreak is overwhelming grief distress, or anguish. Your heart can break when someone dies. Your heart can break when you have a sick child and you don't know how to fix the diagnosis. Your heart can break when the business that you love and have poured all of your heart, mind, and soul into is on the verge of bankruptcy. Your heart can break when your son is addicted and you don't have hope. Your heart can break when you have gone through five rounds of chemotherapy and the doctor is saying that there's nothing else that they can do, your heart can break when someone at church talks poorly about you and whispers about you. Your heart can break when the job that you loved, you now lost. Your heart can break when your sibling doesn't talk to you anymore. So I ask again, have we all dealt with heartbreak? Yeah. So the question I'm now asking is, what do we do? We all have faced heartbreak in some way, shape, or form. And I think it's important for us to know when we talk about heartbreak, if it isn't just romance and relationships, what is heartbreak? Heartbreak is death. It's death of a dream. It's death of a reality. It's death of a desire. It's death of a hope. It could be death of a person. So when that happens, not if, but when that happens, what do we do? Do we stay in a place of literal brokenness or do we find ways to heal and be made well? If you have been with us in this series, uh, the, the goal, as I was crafting this series specifically, I have the desire for us as a community, you and me, our online family, to live integrated lives. Because so many times we live bifurcated lives, like separated. And I don't want that. I want integrated health, integrated wholeness, integrated healing. And last week I kicked off the, the, the series telling a story about a paralyzed man who was on a mat at the pool of Bethesda, or as good Jews say, Bethesda. Thank you, thank you, Bethesda, that's right. And, and this man was a paralyzed man and he had a bunch of excuses as to why he couldn't get healed. He actually had some unmet expectations. And I questioned whether or not he put in effort. And Jesus took his excuses, his expectations and his effort and, and, and jumped over all of it by asking him this one question. By a show of hands, how many were either here last week or caught the message online? Will you raise your hand? Oh my gosh, I love you third service, thank you, yes. You made me so proud. Okay, okay, okay. This is the test. This is the test. What was the question that Jesus asked this paralyzed man? Do you want to be made well? I mean, I'm Jesus on the throne. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Good job. A plus, A plus, A plus. Yes. Jesus asked this question, do you want to be made well? And when I hear this passage preached, there's always the emphasis on you. Do you want to be made well? That's the question that I want to ask. Do you want to be made well? See, because we live integrated lives, um, our mental state affects our emotional state. Our emotional st state affects our psychological state. Our psychological state affects our spiritual state. Uh, in, in scripture that we led off with last week, we are comprised of mind, body, heart, soul. So it's like four legs of a table. If one leg of a table goes out, a table could stand, right? But the moment that any boop, bit of pressure comes on, the table will topple. Our lives are the same. Our lives are the same. If there's one area in our life that, 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 that is off, guess what? We're gonna be off. 
And last week, I asked, I asked us as a community to wrestle with this question. Do you want to be made well? Most people will preach this, do you want to be made well? I'm going to elevate the question, put the emphasis on the word that I think is important. Do you want to be made well? It's a desire. Do you want to live integrated lives? This week, if you said yes to that question last week and you're still here today, bonus points, hallelujah. But now we're gonna talk about the how. Today, I wanna unpack the heart. Proverbs tells us that out of the heart, the issues of the life flow. So I wanna start here because there's an emotional toll that happens when you have a broken heart. See, you could have a ripped and shredded body, 2% body fat, I drink muscle milk every day, 300 grams of protein. You could have an awesome body. But if your heart is broken, you're not well. You could be the sharpest tool in the shed. You can have the quickest wit and the sharpest mind. But if your heart is broken, you won't be whole. Spiritually, you could be, I mean, A++. You could have been to vacation Bible school eight years straight. You could have read the one-year Bible four years in a row. But if your heart is broken, I'm glad you find me funny. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> but if your heart is broken, if your heart is broken, guess what? You won't feel whole. I've been raised in a church where we taught about heaven and what happens after we die. And, and as Christians, we can rejoice because we have the hope of heaven. Yay, Paul the Apostle says, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? And that's awesome until you actually have to deal with death. I remember when my grandmother passed away, um, it felt like the very air in my lungs had been taken away. It wasn't just because I loved my grandmother though I did. It was deeper because we didn't just lose a good godly woman. We lost the matriarch of the Puerto Rican side of our family. And if I'm honest, in, that, in her death, I lost not just my grandmother or our connection to our family, but really my identity in connection to everything that my grandmother represented and stood for. Would I have a connection to Puerto Rico? Would I have a connection to that family? What do I, what do I know about her and her life that has impacted me? And, and, and good intentioned, well intentioned Christians at my grandmother's funeral came up to me are like, she's in a better place. She's with the Lord. I know Susan, thanks, thanks. But right now I'm mourning. Right now I'm sad. And no one taught me how to deal with a broken heart. Today, I wanna to take a look at a biblical death, a biblical death that we see through the pages of scripture to learn how to heal a broken heart. The title of today's message, if you're the note-taking type, is how to heal a broken heart. So let's take a look at some heartbreak in the middle of a death. So turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 11. John chapter 11, we're gonna begin in verse 17. Um, side note, for everyone who's not moving their pages to their Bible, we have a free Bible for you. And I say this not because I'm throwing shade, but because I love you. And the word of God is gonna transform your life. You give God a year of reading the Bible and my God, your life will change. And it's free, 99. Thank you for those that tithe to this church. Pick it up at the Welcome Center. Okay, in John chapter 11, verse 17, it's a story that you're probably most very familiar with. But today I'm gonna serve this up with a different sauce, a sauce that will satiate your hunger and desire in a different way. In John chapter 11, verse 17, we start with this. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. What does that mean? This man, Lazarus, is dead. The scene that we're reading right here out of the pages of John is about a man named Lazarus. And we are told in John chapter 11, verse five, we didn't read it, but trust me, uh, is that Jesus loved Lazarus. And we are told in the verses preceding this verse that people told Jesus, they went up to him, they're like, Jesus, yo, your homeboy, your, 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 your dog, your bestie, your clique, your crew, Laz, Lazzy, you know your boy? He's about to kick the bucket. You gotta go, go get him, but go, go touch him, go pray for him before he passes. In verse 18, now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. By foot, maybe that's an hour. Let's say, for dramatic sake, it's hilly terrain. So let's just say Jesus is only an hour and a half away. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. It is believed that this family, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, were not only a prominent family, but um, that they were a loved family. Not only does scripture say that Jesus loved them, but we are told that so many people from the surrounding areas came to help them mourn for the loss of their brother. Not only were they a prominent family, most likely they were a wealthy family. I actually got to go to the historical home of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha in this area, and it was a large property. So they were a prominent family, a loved family, most likely a wealthy family, because they housed Jesus and the disciples and people from the community. And 
I think they were bougie because they actually fed them. You know the story of Mary and Martha? That's Lazarus' sister. So if they're feeding all these people and they can house them and gather them in the living room, they're bougie, all right? So Martha, who's a friend of Jesus, who she has fed, who she has served, who she fluffed up pillows and said, Jesus, come sit at the head of the table. She called to her friend and said, Jesus, come, because your friend, Lazzy, my brother, he's about to kick the bucket. I know you're gonna come. And Jesus doesn't come. I wonder why didn't Jesus come? If he is out there healing everyone else, why didn't he heal his friend? Look at verse 20. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. We're gonna revisit that in a second. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. And though we aren't Martha, I believe that there's people in this room and watching online and hiding in the video experience that are asking that same question. If you would have been here, you could have. I believe you're able. So why didn't you? Why didn't you heal my grandfather when, when you could have, God? Why didn't you allow my business to thrive when you could have? Why didn't you save my marriage when, when you could have? You're out there healing all these people and yet you're not healing me. You know what I love about the Bible, specifically this passage, is that the Bible is honest about what people were feeling and how they handled pain. Judge Martha, if you will, but at least she's keeping it real. See, in our culture, in our culture, we love to hide pain. We love to cover shame. We love to zip our mouth and say nothing and pretend everything's fine. We Botox our forehead because you don't know if we're happy or sad. We nip, we tuck, we lift, we hide. We hide behind our cars that we're getting in debt over. We hide behind our closed doors that we are losing money in, trying to hide the fact that our marriages are absolutely tore up from the floor up. We hide, we hide, we hide, and we come into church and we say, hallelujah. We hide. If you've ever dealt with heartbreak, pain, or loss, or death, there's, there's actually only three reactions to heartbreak. The first reaction is repression. Repression is when we unconsciously block or stuff or hide or push down a painful memory or traumatic moment. Repressive mem memory loss is when we take a traumatic, painful, heartbreaking situation and we put it in a cave, locked up, in a tomb, in a vault never to be thought of again. Suppression is when we consciously stuff down or block out a painful memory. I won't talk about it, I won't bring it up, I won't say anything, I didn't see anything, I don't wanna do anything, but both repression and suppression are denial. Both repression and suppression are bad because it's denial. So this is the third and the best option, expression. When you go through rough times, when you go through heartbreak, when you go through emotional or physical or psychological death, guess what? God doesn't want you to repress it or suppress it. He wants you to confess it to him and express it to people. That's good, Bianca. I, I know, Bianca, that was good. Amen. Yeah, uh-huh. All right. Y'all came with your church faces today. Listen, when we express our sadness, that is the thing that puts us on the road to healing. That's it. Your healing leads to your wholeness. You will never be whole unless you do the work of healing. Let's pull this, let's pull this back to Lazarus' story. Look at verse 20. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, ooh, she went out to meet him. She's about to express herself. But Mary stayed home. We don't know the intent. Why did she stay home? But behaviorally, this could be suppression. It could be deep grief or sorrow. Martha always gets a bad rap in the Bible, but I like her. I like her. Can I confess? I am her. Like literally, I will complain that if my family, I'm cooking for my family. I'm Hispanic, so we have like 85,072 tenth people in my family. And so when they come over, I'm like, I'm sweating in the kitchen. I'm like, why isn't anyone setting the table? Doesn't anyone see the things that I'm doing? Look, look, dad, look, have Jasmine get up and do something. I, this is Mary and Martha. You know what I love about Martha? She kind of got a little bit of attitude. The cojones on this woman to go up to the savior of the world and say, if you would have been here, <laughs> right? But I give it to her because she was honest with her emotions and her feelings. Who would, be, who would we be as a community if we were honest about the things that we're really questioning God on? The sadness that is lingering in the doldrums of our soul the darkness that we feel and suffer in silence. 
we have to get honest with God. Because if you don't let it out, you will act it out. If you don't let it out in healthy ways, you will act it out in unhealthy ways. So let's make this psychological. Childhood is formative to how healthy we are as adults. Because if we learn how to deal with our pain, our shame, our trauma as children, we'll be able to learn how to act as adults with our pain, our shame, our trauma, and abuse. And the truth of the matter is, is in this room, there are people who, are, who were hurt a long time ago. You were sexually molested by a family member. You were traumatized by something that happened because of your environment or your upbringing. You experienced some sort of trauma or psychological dent, whether by the words of someone you trusted or loved or by the bullying of someone you didn't even know. If, however, you weren't taught as a child to grieve, to mourn, or to express emotions, you won't know how to do that as an adult. And if you don't know how to grieve or mourn or express emotions as an adult, you will not live a healthy, integrated, or whole life. And you can't become whole until you heal. Now, if you don't, this is the seriousness that I just, please, please hear me, stay with me. If you don't grieve the trauma that you've experienced growing up, you get stuck at that age of trauma. If you don't grieve the trauma that happened at a particular age, emotionally and psychologically, you get stuck at that age of trauma. So if you come from a performative family where at, the, at five years old, your parents are trying to put you in every sport and play every uh, musical instrument and they want you to perform for people and you are the token child and look at my child and you have this anxiety now as an adult because no matter what you did, it never met up to your parents' expectations. You as an adult will hide and cower and feel forever insecure. If you were sexually molested at the age of seven years old and told, shh, be quiet, don't be surprised as an adult if you've lost your voice. If you were told by your dad that you will amount to nothing, and yet as a successful business and uh, entrepreneur, businessman and entrepreneur, the moment that you make one mistake, you only hear the voice of your father saying you will amount to nothing. For me, I was illiterate growing up. I've shared that very honestly, openly. I couldn't read, write, or spell at the age of 12. I couldn't, I couldn't comprehend things. And I remember going to Sunday school in church, a place where it was like my reprieve. I loved being with the people of God, but one of the, the most torturous things was in Sunday school in fifth and sixth grade, Mr. Charles and Mr. Robert would, would pass a Bible around and we would read one verse. Each kid would read one verse as we would dive into uh, in reading an entire chapter of the Bible, which side note, for anyone who complains and thinks that service is too long here, you should have gone to my Sunday school, okay? All right, because they're teaching fifth graders how to read exegetical theology and I'm like, here for it. All right. So I remember getting the Bible when it was my time and I opened up the Bible and I was stammering and stum stumbling over my words. And I remember hearing the snickers of kids, people making fun of me and afterwards bullying me because I was dumb or stupid. So now as an adult, if I come to a moment where I don't know something or I don't understand something, if I am not careful, I am prone not to show up like the confident woman who has a 4.0 from graduate school with a master's degree and a Bill Gates Millennium Scholar. No, I'm prone to show up like an insecure 12 year old who is bullied and hates herself because she's stupid. If we are not aware of the trauma that we experience, we'll emotionally be stuck at that age. If there's trauma in your past that you haven't reconciled or healed from, you won't move forward in a healthy way. You can't control the things that have been done to you, but you can control how you get healthy. That's where I want us to camp out. Look at verse 29. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet entered the village, uh, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. Go to verse 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. So how do we heal? Using uh, John 11 as our springboard, I want to pull out some practical things that, that, that scripture is, is showing us in ways that we can heal our hearts. Why does this matter? Because we can't heal if we don't go on the journey of becoming whole. We can't be whole unless we heal. Look at verse 28. After she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. Now, Martha just had a conversation with Jesus. She copped an attitude, doo -doo 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 -doo, boop, 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 all of it. And then Jesus says, go call your sister. And Ma Martha says, the teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. 
I, I want to show you something in, 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 in this text that just wrecked me this week. But Jesus is near to us, and Jesus is calling us. The first thing in healing a broken heart isn't something that we do. I'm a Martha. I'm a doer. What do I need to do to get healthy? What do I need to do? No, no. It's not something we do. It's something we know. We heal when we know Jesus is near. We heal when we know Jesus is near. If you're here today and you have a broken heart, you're experiencing some sort of death, you need to know that Jesus is near and he's asking for you. If you're here today and you're like, no, God, God isn't near. He doesn't feel near. I put some verses on the screen. I want you to take a photo and I want you to remember it this week. Because if you doubt that Jesus is near, let me buttress this with some scripture. Psalm 34, 18 says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. Do you feel pulverized in your pain today? God is near you. Hebrews 13, 5 says, For God has said, I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. I will never forsake you. Isaiah 41, 10 says, So do not fear, for I am with you. I will give you strength. I will help you. God is near you. My twin sister, Jasmine, she listens on the podcast every week. And she says, B, um, why do you always yell in your sermons? <laughs> it's so that you can hear me over the voices of the world and the enemy that's trying to silence you and live your puny lives cowering in fear. I want you to yell so that you could hear me. God is near you and he's calling you. I want to see you. I believe that healing takes place when God is near because he cares. We also see that we heal when we grieve. Grieving is an expression of emotions. Do you know the reason why we have the ability to grieve is because we have a God who's an emotional God. Oh, he's not some cosmic being up in the sky that has no understanding of what pain or shame or loss or trauma is. God knows grief. You know what Isaiah 53.3 says? That Jesus was a man of sorrows, acquainted with the bitterest of grief. He knew suffering First hand, God isn't in the celestial realm saying, buck up, get over it. No, he's a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. So let's talk about grief because there's a healthy grief and unhealthy grief. Moaning is not what we need to do. Mourning is what we need to do. See, moaning is negative. Mourning is positive. Moaning is, oh, me, 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 why, why, why? It's a pity party. It's a pity party, but mourning is crying out to God and saying, I am sad. Where are you? And we have to get comfortable with mourning, crying out, being expressive, letting our emotions go, dealing with our pain. Why? David answers that. But as I stood there in silence, not even speaking good things, the turmoil within me grew worse. You're keeping it in you and you're getting sick. Let it go. And can I address the good, godly men in this room? Can I address the, the men of this house? Psychologically speaking, expressing emotion is incredibly hard for men. Whether it's through family of origin or from culture, we somehow mistakenly had made gender an emotional thing. As if, if you're emotional, then you're feminine. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Because just, just real talk, real talk, no shade, just like stating a fact, men aren't good at grief. And why is that? Because we have been told that crying and emotions is not masculine and not macho. And men, men, don't like negative feelings, a feeling like failure or feeling shame or feeling negative. And somewhere in history, we have told men that crying is weak. And we've told ourselves, men, women, young and old, stop crying, you're being a little girl, stop being a pansy, suck it up. You think this life is hard, just wait till you're an adult. 
That's suppression and repression. Look at what one pastor said. For a man to show emotion isn't a sign of weakness. It's actually a sign of strength. Weak men aren't scared of their emotions. Weak men are afraid of tears. Why? Because it scares them. When you're a strong man, you're not afraid of emotion. You're not afraid to show it. You're not even afraid to cry. Sadness isn't weakness. Jesus was the strongest man, and yet he showed his emotions. He expressed his emotions. Look at verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Verse 35, Jesus wept. The shortest verse in the entire, script, entire Bible, all the scriptures, two words. Jesus wept. It doesn't say that he got emo. It didn't say that, you know, he got a little lump in his throat. It didn't say that he cried or, you know, those gangster tears where it like almost comes out and you go, <laughs> you suck it back up, you know? No. What was the word that was used? You know what wept? You know what wept means? You know what weeping is? It is that deep, guttural loss. Jesus wept. And he didn't weep because Lazarus died. He knew what he was about to do. He wept because of the pain that everyone else was in. It shows us that we have a suffering God who knows our pain and sympathizes with us. That's why it says in Isaiah 61, verse 2, he has sent me to comfort all who mourn to give those who mourn in Zion joy and gladness instead of grief and a song of praise instead of song of sorrow. How do we heal from a broken heart? We heal because he's near. Jesus is saying, I'm with you. We heal because we can grieve with God. God is saying, I'm gonna go through this. I feel this with you. Another way that we heal our broken hearts is that we heal in community. Our hearts are healed in community. Look at verse 19. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. God gives us a spiritual family. You might have an amazing earthly biological family. That's amazing. But, but here at TFH, we speak in terms of a spiritual family. Be, probably because we're as jacked up as a real family too. But like you love them anyway. That's, that's kind of us. But we're a spiritual family. And God never meant for you to go through life alone. God didn't, never meant for you to carry grief alone. That's why I love the Swedish proverb. When you share a joy, it's doubled. When you share a, a sorrow, it's halved. Because we weren't meant to carry the burdens on our back. Like Atlas with the problems of the world. I can't tell anyone. They'll know my shame. They'll know how I failed. They'll judge my family. What will they think about me? So we remain silent. All while we have a spiritual family that's like, how can I help carry this burden with you? Healing comes in community. Now, the Bible's very clear that Jesus heals us of our sin. 1 John 4, 9 says that we confess our trespasses and God is faithful and just to what? Forgive us. That's right, Michaela. 10 points for you. Okay, so, so we confess and we're forgiven. But that's not healing. James 5, 17 says to confess your trespasses amongst the brethren and you will be what? Healed. 10 points for you. Yes, we'll be healed. Wait a minute. Hold on. We confess for forgiveness. We express for healing. My God. My God. I'm not trying to force you, manipulate you, or coerce you to get into a community group. But you know we have community groups here, right? And I know someone's out there thinking like, oh, the community groups are weird. What am I supposed to do? Talk about my feelings? Like, what am I going to meet my best friend, meet a spouse? I'm not promising that you're going to meet your bestie for the restie. I'm not promising you're going to meet your spouse. But I will say there's people in this room who have met their best friends here. There's people in this room testify to the glory of God where you have met your significant other. Hello, somebody. All right. I'm not saying that's gonna happen. What I'm saying is you're walking into this group not so they could heal you or be therapists. You're walking into this group so you can own, I need help. And you may not be the person that I'm gonna do the rest of my life with, but for these six weeks of community group, can I be honest? That's why we gather. If you're here today and you're like, I'm happy. I don't need a community group. I'm healthy and whole. We need community group leaders. We need leaders. Jump right in. So who are you doing this for? Who are you showing up for? And who is showing up for you? Who has the same commitment to you as you have to them? And, and, and I love this because here's more proof of how the community showed up and provided healing. Look at verse 33. 
when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping. We weep with each other. We rejoice with each other. We, we mourn with each other. And here's what I do know about a room of this size and video experience and our online YouTube family. You're either going through pain and you need comfort or you're not going through pain and you can provide somebody comfort. You either need help or you could be the help. Which leads me to the next way to heal. We heal when we help others. We heal when we help others. God uses our heartbreak to help others. Listen to me clearly. There is a purpose. You can find purpose in your pain. That sounds cliche. Sounds like something I heard on Instagram. I don't care if it sounds cliche. It's actually theological. It's called redemptive pain. That you can find. You can find it. You can find purpose in your pain. God wants to use your hurt to help others. We want to hide it. We want to keep it secret. I don't want this to, to come out. I don't want to be shamed. No, no. God will use your hurt to help others. Who better to help a mother of a special needs child than a mother of a special needs child? Who better to help you walk through the loss of a spouse than someone who is a widow? Who better to help you with recovery on the road to recovery and breaking addiction from someone who's walking in recovery and has kicked addiction? Who is better? Who better? Who better? Don't waste your hurt. Don't waste that redemptive hurt. See, God helps us and comforts us not so that we can hoard it, is that we can give it to other people. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians 1.4, that God the Father who comforts us in our trouble so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves have received from God. Let me tell you something you don't wanna hear. Your greatest ministry can come out of your deepest hurt. Why? Because you're feeling what people are feeling. It's like the African proverb says, I've tasted your tears. What does that mean? I've gone through what you're going through. I know. And some of your greatest ministry can come from your deepest misery. When placed in the hands of God, that's redemption. I mentioned my, grand, my grandmother at the beginning of service. What I didn't say is that she passed away 15 years ago. And there's going to be people that are like, get over it. All right. It was so long ago. Don't rush healing. Don't rush healing. Because still to this day, I miss her. And I know that this healing of grieving and mourning her loss will, will, will bring wholeness and redemption to me. And I could see beauty in her absence. I've mourned over her death and think of her from time to time. And I always questioned the impact that her life had on mine and would it matter. But our greatest ministry can come out of our deepest pain. Because this October, me and my mom and my little sister get to fly to Puerto Rico to host a teen women's conference for 200 youth and let them know that they are valuable, that they have worthy and that they matter. And these words and feelings were not something that are just simply biblical. These are the words that my grandmother spoke over me and now I get to speak them over the next generation. So our hearts are healed when we draw close to the Lord and we know he's there. Our hearts are healed when we grieve. Our hearts are healed when we're in community. Our hearts are healed when we, we help other people. And now the last way that we can heal our broken heart is not gonna make sense to most people. In fact, if you're not a believer, if you're not a follower of Jesus, I mean, I hope you are by the end of the service, but if you're not a follower of Jesus in this room, this isn't gonna make sense to you. But stay with me, stay with me. We heal in light of eternity. As a believer, this life is not all there is. Drake coined YOLO, you only live once. And I'm like, oh no, I live twice, baby. I live twice. I live here and I live with the Lord in light of eternity. He is preparing a place for you and me and it's for eternity. We have a hope of heaven. This, this, this right here, this ain't all there is, baby. Because here on earth, there is pain. There is sadness here. There is sorrow here. There is mourning here. There's broken hearts here. There is death here. There's bankruptcy here. But all of that will cease to exist in heaven. Heaven is my hope. Wholeness is in heaven. And I'm sure that you're sitting here and you're thinking with your heartbreak and your loss, <laughs> yeah, 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 Bianca, heaven with holiness and hope and halos, sure, yep, yep. If that's what you're feeling, you're not alone. Look at what Martha says in verse 23. Martha said to her, 
Or Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, ha, sure, sure, sure. Yep, 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 got it. Mm -hmm. I know he'll rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Do you hear her getting so spiritual? And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And I'm asking you the same question. Do you believe this? Do you believe in an eternity with the Lord and Savior where there is no mourning, there's no pain, there's no shame, there's no loss? My hope is in heaven. And Revelation 21.4 tells us this, that he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. One day, I will be reunited with the King of glory and I will stand side by side with people who have gone before me, including my grandmother as we worship the Lord. And I'll look around and say, you got in too? Oh, the grace of God is alive. I mean, don't lie. You know you're going to do the same thing. Some of, some of y'all are going to be like, I got in by the grace of God. Uh-huh. I know the sheep. I know the sheep. All right. But we're all going to stand back, raise our hands and say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And we will worship the Lord in spirit and truth because we find hope and healing and wholeness in heaven. And today, if you are broken heart and you have been repressing and suppressing in a stone cold tomb sealed by a stone, I have, I have good news for you. We have a savior who wants you to confess what you're feeling and express your emotions. And he wants you to live set free. Lazarus was dead and sealed in a tomb, suppressed in a cave, repressed from the world. But Mary and Martha were feeling all sorts of things. And maybe that's the way that you feel, where you have been repressing and suppressing and hiding and closing your eyes and wishing it all away. But what did Jesus do for Lazarus? Look at verse 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they might believe that you sent me. Then he had said this. When he said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and his feet wrapped in strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Derek, come out. Joey, come out. Marion, come out. Jasmine, come out. Open up the cave of your heart that is cold and dark and empty with sadness that has been repressed and suppressed. Come out, because the Lord is near to those who call him. Come grieve with the Lord. Come heal with the Lord. Come rejoice in the hope of heaven, because we have a loving Savior that sees you and is calling you to come forth. Here in our culture, we're very prone to be like, what? It's the end of service. I got to go. I have brunch plans. And I'm just saying, it's time we do the work. Because we can leave and we could say, I have my five things I need to do, so I'm going to heal. But we're not creating space. This is the sanctuary of the living God. That the very presence of God has dwelt among us. And he's whispering to you, I see your fears. I hear, I hear your pain. I weep for the things that have been done to you. I grieve with you. Come grieve with me. I could take it. Tell me where I let you down and I will show you the purpose in the, pain, in the pain. I will show you that I have a plan that will blow your mind. Give it to me. Weep and mourn. 
experience my closeness. I'm going to ask that we remain seated. I'm going to ask that nobody get up, leave, go to the bathroom. Everything can wait. I want you to hear from God. I want you to use your words to tell God what you need to heal your broken heart. Spirit of living God, we thank you for your word, for this space, for this house. Your presence is welcomed here and invited. And as we roll away the stone from the tombs of our hearts, whatever comes out as ugly as it is, God, we lay it at your feet. Heal us, see us, know us, call us out and heal our broken hearts in this moment. I'm crazy enough to believe that you can. In Jesus' name.